um, I've never I've never been a coder. Okay. Uh, sure. So, yeah. So I, I've got a background of of, of you know from uh, basic to visual basic to um, C, um, not necessarily plus plus. I don't think um, Python and and obviously I you know I've looked at JavaScript in the old days. When sure. It was just so Fancy sure. Up. So yeah. So that's good. So so objects uh, in the general sense are are a concept that's around in any um, what we would call object oriented language, and even some languages that that aren't purely object oriented. And the idea is really just um, uh, a data structure that holds information. Um, and in JavaScript, they're a bit different um, than you would see in other languages. Um, and, and very simply in JavaScript, I'm going to flip over here on my screen to a um, system called Plunker. I think we showed in the first week just a way that we can uh, we can write easy, you know, JavaScript editor here. So um, we could create an object in JavaScript simply by doing something like this. Um, and what we're saying is, um, let's get rid of this extra closing. So. In JavaScript, we use the var keyword to just declare a variable, and then we give that variable a name, and we set that variable equal to something. And um, this notation that I used here, an open curly brace with a closed curly brace, uh, and we put a semicolon there, and then, um, oh, sorry, not equals, and then some characters here. This is called JavaScript object notation or object literals. Um, sometimes you'll see this referred to as JSON, JavaScript object. Um, notation. And it's simply a, a name value pair type syntax. So we have an object I created called my object, and then two, what we would call properties, two properties, one called foo, one called bar. And then on the right side, we set values to those properties. So it's just a name value pair. Um, so, and in JavaScript, you'll notice that uh, unlike some of the other languages, um, that are out there. We don't have type information. So in something like um, in something like C sharp or in Java or in C you might have some type information that would be something like this. It would say like maybe int or string, and that would be the type of the variable that you're defining. Um, now those keywords and that concept doesn't exist in JavaScript. You don't need to put the type information. So we simply give a name, and on the right side we give a value. And one of the things you might notice from that, because we don't have type information, is that um, we could do something if we went to use this object down below here. We could say my object dot foo equals, um, and you see that I just changed the type. So here I created an, something called uh, my object, and I have a property I declared called foo, and I set its value, its initial value to one, which we would think of as an integer. Uh, but then later on in some code, I went and changed its value and set it equal to a string. And, and that's perfectly legal in JavaScript because there's, there's no type here. It doesn't restrict what value you can put into the properties of an object. So that's kind of one thing to know about JavaScript is, is when you're declaring your objects, there's a, a lack of type information specified. Um, also, when you declare these objects, they don't have to be simple properties. They can be um, uh, like a function, for instance. And a function for add might be something like this. So you declared a function called add, um, and it takes in two parameters, a and b, and it returns the value of adding a and b together. And then when you wanted to use that, you would do something like this. And you would say maybe uh, var result equals. And now you're calling the add function on your object, passing it a one and a two, and the, the result of this would be a three. It would run this code here. Um, so this is probably the most common way that you'll see an object in JavaScript defined. Um, it's simply the var keyword, some name, and then an opening curly brace and a set of properties in that object. Um, but that's a very good question. That's uh, that that does confuse a lot of people. Is how objects work in JavaScript and and what the point of objects are. Um, and when we talk about creating objects, we get into kind of a whole another section. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on today, uh, a little bit later in our meeting about 
object creation because that gets a bit more complicated. <clears throat> so, Dad, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry, could you just, just come back in again. Um, I, I, I'm getting a huge long delay before I actually see the um, your screen change on, okay. uh, on this end because I'm I'm in the UK. Okay. Um, and probably my, my connection is a bit slow. Um, Lynn wrote to Ike or to the group mm -hmm. on the 6th of September and she talked about she was also having problems and she referenced the eloquent javascript.net mm -hmm. and I've just started with that and I find that really helpful because of the um, exercises which occur at the end of every lesson sure. that's it yeah and um, and, and and so I, I I mean, I think that, that I'm really just going to have to work through because they, they have an excellent explanation of uh, objects and their properties and so forth, which kind of is, is slower than the way in which um, Zakas introduces them. Sure. Yeah, and I'm not... I mean, I, I'm not I'm going to have to... This book? I'm going to have to kind of just catching up on the rest of you guys. Sure. Sure. So I'm not familiar with this book, um, but it does look pretty good. We took a look at it when Lynn posted it. So um, thank you for that, Lynn. Um, and it does it does look very interesting. So we need to catch up with it. I haven't read it. So, um, you know, uh, but I just jumped in here. So this is eloquentjavascript.net. We just jumped down to maybe their uh, their chapter on objects to kind of further what we were um, <clears throat> what we were saying. And they're kind of saying the same thing here. And methods are simply properties that hold function values. Um, and so again, we've got var rabbit equals open close curly. And so in my case, I said var object equals open curly, and then I put some properties. I could have just did open close curly with a semicolon, just like we've done here, where it says rabbit equals, and that actually creates a uh, an object called rabbit, but it's empty. Uh, and then you can assign values to properties that you create on the fly. And this is the dynamic aspect of JavaScript. Um, notice that in this line where they create an object called rabbit, there is no property on the object called speak. But in the next line down, they say rabbit.speak equals, and they set it equal to something. They've just introduced a new property dynamically, which didn't exist in the line previously, um, but that's allowed in JavaScript. Um, since it's a dynamic language, you can append values to an object at any point in time. Um, and so then they go ahead and do just like I did with the add function. Um, they create a property that's equal to a function and it does some work. And then um, in the next line down here on line six, they uh, they call that function and they say rabbit dot speak and they pass some value. And then the result of that actually executes this code here. Um, so if you're familiar with a language like C sharp or um, C plus plus, um, or Java, this will be a little bit different, um, maybe a little bit easier for you. Sorry, there's a little background noise if you might hear that. Um, uh, maybe a little easier because it's a, just a little simpler. Um, it's not as rigid in defining the objects like C Sharp would be. You, in C Sharp, you could not do something like this if you called, if you, if you said rabbit.speak and that didn't already exist, um, that would throw a runtime error. So. Um, so another point, and, and thanks for your question there, John. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you back on mute and give people other people some opportunities uh, to ask some questions. Um, and let me see if I can put that down there. And if you have another follow up question, feel free to raise your hand again. Um, so um, yeah, so so you might find it a little simpler, a, a little less rigid than a language like C sharp. Um, another thing to notice, and and you know this isn't necessarily called out. Um, directly in the reading or in the learn JavaScript properly, but I'm sure you've understood through your reading here and, and in your practicing uh, in writing JavaScript that there is no compilation step in JavaScript. Um, in a language like C++ or C Sharp or Java, there's a compile step. So you write some code and then you press some button in your editor or you execute some script and it will compile that code uh, and it'll take the code that you wrote in that particular language and produce um, machine level code at some some way. Uh, C Sharp creates something called IL, intermediate language. Uh, Java creates an intermediate language as well. C++ produces 
actual byte code for the CPU that you're on. <clears throat> JavaScript doesn't have any of that. It's an it's it's what's called an interpreted language. Um, so it takes this code you've written directly and interprets it on the fly. That's why you can do some of these dynamic things, um, and you can uh, you can dynamically invoke code that's just a string of code, for instance. There's some interesting things you can do with the language um, that uh, that may be a, a little bit shocking to you if you don't come from a dynamic language background. You're not used to these kinds of things. So <clears throat> those are maybe some ground rules to, to keep uh, in mind when we're learning about this stuff. But good question on the objects. Um, I think it does confuse people. Uh, I'm going to run through a couple more questions. If anybody else has questions, you know, feel free to, to raise your hand. We have a pretty small group today, so uh, hopefully we can get through all of your questions. Um, so um, let's, uh, I, these are kind of going through some of the questions from the reading. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have a good answer. Uh, we'll, we'll try this. I'll, I'll put a question out there. And if you have an answer, go ahead and type it in the chat. And we'll see how quickly we can do this. Um, so uh, one question is, uh, is JavaScript uh, case sensitive or is it case insensitive? And what I mean by that is uh, right here, I've defined a variable called my object. Now, can I say uh, my object? Like this, is that the same as me saying my object like this, or my object like this, or my object like this? Does it think all of those are the same? So is it case sensitive or case insensitive? And if you have an answer, just uh, throw it in chat there. We'll see how this works for the first couple. See if there's a big delay. Or if anybody's even paying attention. <clears throat> I have the right panel. OK, so Gary got an answer in there, case sensitive. So that's right. Yeah, Gary got his answer in uh, case sensitive is correct. Um, and what that means is that none of these are the same. Um, these are all different objects. So I've defined it as my object with a capital O, and that's the way I have to use it from then on. And, and in JavaScript, the generally accepted um, pattern, because it's a case sensitive language, um, is by and large to have things as all lowercase. So you'll notice that all my properties here I did as lowercase. Um, and only when you need to delineate two words like my and object would you uppercase the second uh, the second word and any subsequent word. Um, so like if I was to add more words, my object is cool, then I would I would uppercase the the words as they go. But generally you start with lowercase. The reason being uh, if I wanted to create a function um, and and I wanted to call it multiply, um, the idea is that lowercase is easier to not confuse if you did that, um, which you would see commonly in a language like C Sharp or Java. Um, uh, it's, a little, it's easier for you to get uh, confused in JavaScript or messed up in JavaScript. The reason is that there, uh, because there's no compilation step in JavaScript, there's no checking to see whether you called that correctly. So if I want to call, um, Let's, let's just do this example, my object.add. If I did that uh, and I called dot add with an uppercase A uh, and I had defined it with a lowercase A, that's not going to work, but I'm not going to know that's not going to work until that code runs. Whereas in a language like C Sharp or JavaScript, um, uh, sorry, C Sharp or Java, you would know at the compilation step that that doesn't compile. And often your editor would tell you right away, hey, that's not valid. Um, you need to change that. So. The generally accepted practice in JavaScript is to keep everything lowercase. Uh, and if everybody goes with that, then it's easier to avoid these kinds of problems. Um, and that's why I've defined these all as lowercase here, just kind of out of habit to follow the style guide. Um, OK. Um, <clears throat> so we talked about convention. Um, so what, um, what keyword do you use to define a variable in JavaScript? And it should be pretty straightforward. You can see that on my screen, uh, I've used it in two places. So what, what keyword is that uh, to define the variable? Uh, and Lynn's got an answer in there. She wins this time. So var, that's correct. Um, so the var keyword here next to results or the var keyword up above on line three, which is next to my object, the, both of those are uh, the keyword used to declare a variable. Um, and Again, uh, you know, my background is a lot of C Sharp, so I'll relate a lot of this back to C Sharp. You may be familiar with the var keyword from C Sharp, uh, 
Um, these are two different things, um, so don't don't confuse them. Don't think that they're the same. Um, var is simply a keyword in JavaScript to say new variable because there is no type information. Um, what you might be used to is something like instead of var, you put the um, the type before you put the variable. That's something you would see in C Sharp or in Java or in C++. Um, but again, no types in JavaScript. Uh, so you just put var. You don't specify the type. OK. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. Um, OK, so when a variable um, uh, is not initialized, what is the value that it has? So if we tried to call, um, if we tried to say something like my object um, dot Brad, uh, and we said maybe uh, var my variable equals my object dot Brad. Now I'm calling a um, a property here or a variable here that doesn't exist in my object. This line of code will execute in JavaScript uh, because it. Um, because there's no compilation step, it will get all the way to this line of code and run. And this won't throw an exception. This will actually assign a certain value to my variable. And what will that be? And it looks like Brian wins this time. So undefined is the answer. Um, so it's not null. It's not empty. Uh, it's not blank. Uh, the value that you would get here would actually be undefined, uh, which makes sense. We're saying that, um, hey, there's a variable you're calling which is not defined. It, it doesn't exist. There's no initialization. No one's created this. Um, so it's just undefined. This is a pretty common um, pretty common problem in JavaScript. Uh, you'll see a lot of undefined errors. A lot of the times, it's because of something like this. Um, let's say that I actually had something called Brad, and it was my name. Um, and now. Notice line 14, what's the problem here? So line 14 is going to give me an undefined when I do that. And the problem is the case sensitivity of JavaScript, right? I, I'm saying my object.brad with a capital B, um, and the property that's up here is a lowercase b, so those are actually not the same thing. So line 14 is going to say, hey, uh, Brad with a capital B, that's undefined. But if I were to do that, it wouldn't do undefined. It would actually put uh, my name uh, in this variable here. So you'll often, if you're debugging JavaScript and you see undefined errors, one of the first places I would look is uh, case sensitive issues. Uh, you've either misspelled or mistyped something, or you possibly have uh, the wrong case for a variable um, or a function. And that's why everybody sticks with lowercase. We want to keep the convention at lowercase so that you can quickly eliminate those. If you were, if you saw some code in JavaScript like this, where the property name was uppercase, my first guess would be look at that because it's probably wrong. Um, either the library you're using is not following convention, or the code you typed is is uh, incorrect because the case sensitivity is wrong. Okay, um, let's try. Um, Scrolling through my list here. So uh, here's one uh, from the reading from chapter, what is this, chapter chapter three, I think. And um, what is the for in statement used for? Uh, for dash in, F-O-R dash I-N. Let me delete these. So anybody remember what the for in, for in statement is used for? So it might be a little trickier to write out the answer. All right, so uh, for in is used to enumerate um, properties, uh, all of the properties uh, on an object. And most commonly, um, you add the, uh, oh yeah, Gary and John got it, yeah, uh, looping through properties. So. Most commonly, that's used with a filter for has own property. And what you're trying to do 
because of the dynamic aspect of JavaScript, you're trying to figure out if this object has a certain property and you're looping through all of the properties on the object. Um, and there is a filter called has own property, which will tell you whether the property you're looking for is on this object itself or um, its prototype or one of its parent objects. Um, oftentimes what you're looking for is to say, does this object have the Brad property? And I wanna know. Um, so I will loop through all the properties and use the um, use the has own property filter to to see whether that's on this object or some other objects. Um, okay. So uh, how are uh, multiple arguments passed to a JavaScript function, um, and really what does this do? So here I've got an add, and what if I did something like this? Just put a bunch here. So I've got uh, an add method, and I've got all of these properties, and the add method only um, only accepts two properties. Oh, and we have a question from Lynn. Let me make sure I guess that. Uh, why would you use for in versus for? Uh, for in just makes it a little, so why would you use for in versus for? Um, for loops are a little more uh, explicit and you have to hang on to the iterator. So you have to hang on to the i, for instance, for i equals zero to 10. Uh, for in is used when you don't care about the iterator and you just have a collection of objects you want to loop through. So you don't have to hold on to that extra variable and the looping structure is a little bit easier to write out. Uh, and it's just stuck to, um, you know, go it, it implicitly will go through all of the items in the collection, for instance, all of the properties in the object. Perfect. Okay. Um, so what happens here? So we have the add method and we have a whole bunch of param uh, a whole bunch of parameters passed, but the function only takes two. Um, so what happens in this case? Does anybody remember from the reading? Like, how are those arguments passed to JavaScript? And what does it mean if we pass too many? Or even even better, what does it mean if I were to do something like on the next line, and I were to only pass one? Is are either of those lines legal? Will it work? Will it throw an exception? Does anybody have a guess at what it might do? Um, so what what might what might happen on line twelve here? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and our method takes two and adds together a and b. What do we think the result uh, of this one will be? Will it work? Any guesses? Yeah, Gary says the others are ignored. So that, that's right. So the answer of this is still going to be three. It's going to be one plus two, and then it will ignore all of the other ones. Um, and the reason that is done that way is because the parameters are passed to a method via an array. And um, that array uh, will just ignore the additional, um, uh, the additional uh, parameters. If you map two, of it two items, you declare two parameters here, it will take the first two items in the array that got passed. Um, if you pass any more than that, it will just exclude them. In this case, uh, my object.add, what do we think the answer will be here? We only have one, but the function expects two. Um, yeah, and John says it accepts whatever. Yeah, that's true. It, it, so it will take the one in, and what will the value of b uh, be? What <laughs> will the value of b be? Uh, in this case, it'll be undefined. So we would be doing one plus undefined, right? It would just be undefined. So you're going to get undefined as the result here. So it won't be uh, an exception. It won't be, uh, the error may not be clear to you because it won't say, hey, you didn't pass enough arguments to this function. It will simply say, in this case, it will say undefined. Um, and that's because, the uh, like John said, it will accept whatever. Uh, if you've done any... Uh, Ruby in the past. This is very similar to how Ruby does it. Ruby has flexible argument lists and will kind of take whatever you want to pass it. Um, and it does it in order. It, you know, it's an array. It does it in order. So I could add uh, C and D here, and I could do A plus B plus C plus D, and now it would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 would be my result, and then it would ignore the rest of them. And if I went up and you know deleted D and deleted it here, uh, or even or even you know still took D in but just didn't add it, that would work fine too, right? We'd get values for A, B, C, D, 
but we just add the first three, or we could just not take in D. It will, it will let you do pretty much whatever you want there. Um, so that can be a good thing and a bad thing. It can be um, very useful to have flexible parameter lists uh, and have functions that maybe check to see if I have three parameters do this, if I have two parameters do this. Um, but it can also be dangerous in that you can do something like here where you don't pass the right number of arguments. So a modern JavaScript editor, something like Visual Studio or um, WebStorm um, or even Sublime Text, any of these editors, those, um, those will do a pretty good job of looking at the function that you're calling and showing you what the argument list should be. So hopefully you can eliminate that through an editor. Um, but if you're just doing something like in Plunker or in Fiddler or in just a normal text editor, uh, you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to know what the argument list of the function is unless you went and looked at it. Uh, and so you could get yourself into problems there. So just be aware of that. OK, um, I'm going to keep going through my questions here unless other people have questions. I'm going to go ahead and delete these. Feel free to put our hands up. We're about 30 minutes in, so we've got a little bit more time left. Um, OK, um, so let's talk a little bit about um, Let's talk a little bit about garbage collection. Uh, we learned about that a little, um, and that might be unfamiliar to you uh, if you haven't worked in a language that is garbage collected. If you've worked in um, in Java or C Sharp, those are, are those are common languages that have garbage collection. Uh, and the idea behind garbage collection is simply that when you allocate memory uh, for your program. Um, that memory will be freed up for you automatically by uh, something called the garbage collector once the um, the variable or the object that's using that memory has gone out of scope. So what that means in um, you know it, it means that you declare a variable and you use that variable and then that piece of code is no longer accessible. Uh, whether that means that the uh, in JavaScript, that means like the file is no longer loaded, for instance. Um, then the memory that had been allocated uh, for that um, will be freed up for you. So the garbage collection is the responsibility of the browser. Um, and maybe this has become clear to you, maybe it hasn't, that each individual web browser uh, is responsible for implementing the JavaScript runtime. So uh, Chrome has their own JavaScript runtime called V8. Uh, Internet Explorer has their own. Um, can't remember the name of it these days. They've changed it a couple times. Might be Titan or something these days. Um, Safari has their own. Um, you know, Firefox has their own. So it's the responsibility of the browser to implement the interpreter for JavaScript. And as part of the interpreter, they're also implementing the garbage collector. So that garbage collection um, is, is implemented by the browser. And uh, do you remember from the reading what the most commonly used type of garbage collection is? There was, they called out kind of the different styles of garbage collection that can be done. And um, there was one most commonly used pattern for garbage collection. Uh, and it's the pattern that you're probably familiar with if you're familiar with C-sharp also. It's the pattern that the C-sharp garbage collector uses. Uh, and, and really what we're talking about is how does the garbage collector figure out what objects are garbage? <clears throat> so if anybody remembers what the name of that pattern was, go ahead and throw an answer in there. Um, so John says first in, first out. Uh, it's not quite right. Yeah, Lynn got it right. So Lynn says mark and sweep. Um, and that's right. So the pattern is called mark and sweep. And basically what that means is that it's a uh, it's what you call a two pass garbage collection. Um, the first pass is the mark pass, which means the garbage collector will go through all of the objects it has in memory and it will trace the objects. Uh, it'll chase the object graph and try to find out who owns what. And it will mark any of the objects that it thinks are garbage. So it will mark all of the objects and say, well, I don't see any references to these objects anymore. 
Um, the In the case of JavaScript, maybe the JavaScript file has gone out of scope. It's no longer loaded by this browser page. Um, something like that. And, and so it would mark them and say, I think these are garbage. And then the next pass um, would be uh, would be the sweet pass. So then it would go through and instead of iterating the entire object graph, it would just grab the ones that were marked and then sweep them away, which basically means to deallocate the memory. Um, so C Sharp does a similar thing. They have a mark and sweep garbage collector that, that tends to be the most performant way to do garbage collection, which is why it's the most commonly implemented across the browsers. Um, but just know that you know the, the key there is there is garbage collection. Um, for you, and it's the responsibility of the browser to do that. So yeah, you rarely, but you may see differences between, say, Safari and Chrome, or Internet Explorer and Chrome, and how they collect garbage. If you're really trying to performance tune a JavaScript-based application, and you're really looking at the memory footprint it's using, you may very well see differences between on the same app between IE and Chrome because of the way they decide to collect garbage. Um, so that kind of dovetails into a question that I thought was uh, useful from, I think we jump ahead here, but it's from chapter eight. Um, so we're talking about mark and sweep and there's garbage collector that's gonna do this operation. So how does that work? Is JavaScript multi-threaded or single-threaded? Does anybody remember? And the reason I ask that is because the garbage collector has this work to do on our behalf that's running at some point during the application um, and we don't invoke it. And so the question is, is the garbage collector running on a separate thread or is the garbage collector running on the same thread we're running on and, and what impact does that have? Um, so John says that it's single threaded. Uh, so he got that right. It actually is single threaded. Um, and if you've done programming in other major languages, this, this, uh, this might be a bit different to you that you you can't spin off new threads. Uh, and what that means, if you're not familiar with multi-threaded at all, what that means is you can't, um, you can't run parallel execution. So you can't have two functions running at the same time in parallel uh, <clears throat> because there's only one thread dedicated to the JavaScript engine. So um, some of this is, is up to the way that the browser implementers write it. So I know Chrome has some special tricks it does behind the scenes to actually it's not a separate thread, but a separate JavaScript process. And they do some communication between the two, and some of that's for garbage collection. They do some really funky stuff. But JavaScript as a language is single-threaded. So um, if JavaScript is single-threaded, um, how do we schedule code to execute at a certain time? There was two ways that we talked about in Chapter 8 that you could schedule code to say, execute in the future. Um, and most of the time, in multi-threaded environments, when you want to schedule some code, you do it by creating a thread and putting that code on the thread and say, go do this code on a separate thread and let me know when you're done. In JavaScript, since it's single threaded, do you, do you remember, if you guys remember either of the two ways that you could use to say, go run this code in the future um, or go run this code over and over again, that might, that might trigger your memory. Does anybody remember what either of those two methods were? So they were set timeout and set interval. Um, and um, set timeout um, would say something like this. All right. So set timeout would say, let's go with 1,000. Um, set a timeout 1,000 milliseconds from now, so one second from now. And when that expires, run schedule, sorry, schedule this chunk of code in the function to execute. Um, so since JavaScript is single threaded, uh, it has a work queue. Basically, it has the things it needs to do, um, the operations that it's doing that are stacked up. So if you want to, say, put something on the queue to be executed, at a later point in time, say one second from now, you say set timeout one second, here's the function, go ahead and put this into the queue, but don't put it in the work queue until one second from now. So it's not quite the same as saying execute this in one second. It says in one second, put it on the queue to be executed. And then that may or may not happen immediately. 
if you push some code onto the queue and it's empty, then it will execute immediately, right? So one second from now, if you say put this function on the queue and the queue is empty at that point in time, then that code will execute immediately. If you say one second from now, put this code on the queue and there's other things in the queue still waiting to be worked on, you will go to the last position in the queue. What that really means is something like a couple more milliseconds probably, because it's probably some short running operations um, that are in flight that you need to wait for. So you can't really use set timeout or even set interval um, as deterministic. It won't guarantee that you will run in exactly one second, but it will be probably pretty close to that. Um, so don't use it as a way to say deterministically, it will always be one second from now. Um, but, um, but it is a good way to schedule things in the future. And the only difference here in set interval, if you did something like this, um, set interval, in the same fashion would do every one second schedule this piece of code to be executed. So rather than set timeout, which says uh, in one second, go ahead and throw this on the work queue, set interval says every second from now, push this bit of code to be run. So that would be something like a heartbeat monitor, like you're trying to ping back to a server, maybe go query something to see if it's still alive, something like that, you could do it over and over again. Um, um, the issue is that you'd have to clear that interval. And so the result of set interval, I always say something like token, the result of set interval is basically a token that you hang on to. And then you would say something like a clear interval and you would pass it the token when you want it to stop repeating, right? Once you set the interval, you have to then clear the interval. Generally, this is this is bad practice because people forget to clear the intervals. Um, so, and, and really, you rarely have a need to do something in JavaScript on a consistent interval basis like that. So, set timeout tends to be uh, tends to be a better way to do it. Let's just say one second from now, run this bit of code. Okay, um, let's go with something a little easier. That's a little bit deep. You know, the threading and the scheduling of works a little bit deep. So, um, uh, what um, what is another name for the uh, window object? So we talk about, um, and John's got a question here. This is like closing a database connection. Um, closing a database connection. Sure, if you wanted to close it in the future, yeah, maybe, maybe something like close the database connection. Usually the closing the database connection would be a little more deterministic. It'd be like, once I get my data back, go ahead and close the connection. And and really in JavaScript, you want to be careful about that. You won't, you don't, you shouldn't really ever be creating an actual connection to a database um, in JavaScript, in client-side JavaScript. Uh, you should probably be going through a server, like a web service, and that should be communicating with the database because you run the risk. Remember, um, uh, so in fact, let's just look here. Um, here, let's just look at this page. Remember, JavaScript is interpreted. It's not compiled. So uh, if I just right click on any page and I inspect element, um, I'm likely to find things like JavaScript right here just in plain text. So if you were, if you were connecting to a database, for instance, that would be really bad because you'd have like your database connection string and your password and things like that right here in plain text that anybody could take. So that, that's definitely not something you want to do that's that's a security hole so um, just you know just be um, just be careful John says I remember a warning about closing sessions and not leaving things open yeah definitely you want to make sure you clean up after yourself when you're connecting to a database but but in general um, really you should never connect to a database from client side JavaScript it's too much of a security risk um, you should be going back to a server and that server should be connecting to the database. You wouldn't expose your database to be you know, public so that the internet could go direct to your database. That, that would be a bit scary. So, uh, okay, so what's, um, what's another, um, let me go back to Plunker here. What's another term for the window object? So if you remember in JavaScript, there was in chapter eight, we talked about the hierarchy of objects and um, window was kind of the, the top level element, right? You could say window dot open, window dot close. Uh, 
window dot anything. Um, so did anybody remember the other term that was kind of analogous to window? Or if you defined variables on the window, they were implicitly defined in this other object. Does anybody remember what that was? Yeah, Gary says global. That's right. That's the scary one. Um, so window is analogous to the global object. And JavaScript has a big weakness in that it has a heavy reliance on global variables. Um, a lot of the problems we see in JavaScript are because of globals. And a lot of the, the frameworks out there and a lot of the patterns that we follow are to mitigate um, the use of global variables. So um, for instance, I've declared these properties as uh, members of my object, but right here I've just said var my object. And so my object is now global. Uh, it's attached to the window or um, you know, attached to the global object, which means that I can say something like my object dot anywhere in JavaScript code. And that's available because that's the same as saying uh, window, uh, if you spell it right, the same as saying window dot my object, right? So the scary thing about that is uh, you can have naming collisions. So you can imagine my object is not a very specific name. It's it's probably been taken by some other script that's been loaded somewhere. Remember, you're not necessarily the only code that's on the page. Um, I, in fact, in my Chrome, for instance, uh, if I pull this over a little bit, I've got all these plugins right here, and these plugins are actually run by JavaScript. So if I look at uh, anybody's page, for instance, um, Plunker's page, if I inspect element and um, at some point in here, it might be a little bit tricky to find, but probably if I go here, I can see it. Um, yeah, so I've got other things being run here from other domains. Um, Google Analytics, that's probably them putting in there. I'm not sure what that GitHub is. Oftentimes you'll see plugins are just showing. So for instance, um, uh, Feedly Mini here, this is like um, a tack on to the page that one of my extensions is doing. It's actually editing the page. So you could run into a situation where you create an object called foo and some other script has created an object called foo. And, um, and that's bad because now you guys are colliding with one another and figuring out what the right object is would be a challenge. So you gotta be conscious of globals. There's a simple pattern we use um, in JavaScript to avoid this kind of called namespacing. So um, you would do something like this um, you would say, you know, um, my company um, equals this and then like bar my product. Um, or you'd say something like uh, my company dot my product equals. And now what we're declaring are empty objects, but they act as namespaces. Right. So I've got an empty object I created called my company. So that would be like, let's just say that we worked at um, uh, Microsoft. And then this would be Microsoft um, dot. Uh, let's say this is Internet Explorer code, Internet Explorer. And then here, what I would say, instead of just var, I would say Microsoft dot Internet Explorer dot. And now you've got kind of this namespacing pattern, right? So now this is much more specific. It's not just my object. Now this is still, you know, Microsoft is in the global. And so we'd have to put some additional checks here to see whether Microsoft is defined or not. Um, and there's a couple little patterns to do that. But if you pick something that's unique enough, you're in much better shape. Uh, and then this um, Internet Explorer is underneath Microsoft, and then my object is underneath both of those. So you get this kind of pattern of hiding your objects so they're not globally available to everybody. Um, so that's a that's a big thing to look out for in uh, in JavaScript is to watch out for the problems with globals and know that anything declared at the top level like this is declared on the window object, which is also the global object. And Lynn has a question here. Does that change the scope of what's inside my object? Um, does that change the scope? Sure. Uh, it doesn't change the scope. Uh, so this is not, this is not valid anymore. My object does not live off the global. So now I would have to call it by, by appending this stuff, right? So it definitely changes the scope of my object itself, but the scope of what's inside doesn't 
doesn't change because you always have to, you know, even before we put these namespaces in, we had to prefix, uh, calling the add method had to be prefixed with my object. So the scope underneath is still the same, if that makes sense. Um, but getting to that object now is more involved. There's more dots in front of it. Hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, uh, we're running low on time here, so let me wrap up uh, with just maybe one or two more questions. Um, uh, we didn't quite get through everything we wanted to, but okay, so we talked in chapter nine and 10, we're talking about the DOM um, and we're talking about manipulating elements in the DOM and manipulating HTML. Um, and there was a section on, I think I'll end with this, there was a section on capability detection or client detection. Um, and it was talking about how you detect what browser your user is in, whether they're in Internet Explorer, they're in Chrome or Firefox, or they're in um, uh, they're in a mobile browser, for instance. And there was a couple of ways to do it. Um, and the preferred way is capability detection. Um, and what that means is uh, basically asking the browser whether they implement whatever feature you may need. Um, it doesn't tell you what browser they're using. So it doesn't tell you whether they're in Chrome or not. It just tells you that the browser can do what you're about to ask it to do. And that's a much better way to, to operate because you know the new browsers come out all the time. I mean, they don't, not as much anymore, but you know, there was a period of time where there was Chrome and Firefox and Safari were all pretty new and people had written a bunch of code for Internet Explorer and didn't know how to handle these new browsers. And so um, but there are new mobile browsers that come out. There are changes to the browser. You know, there's a, there's a web browser on my television these days. There's a web browser on my printer. There's a web browser on my phone, on my tablet. And they all kind of are different. So it's really hard to say, are you in Safari or are you in mobile Safari? Or are you in the Samsung TV browser? It's much easier to just say, does this browser do the following things? And if it does, then, then let that happen. Um, uh, so John saying, I'm confused. I thought we were at the end of week four. Chapter 10 is for weeks five and six. Um, I may have these wrong. We may have slowed down a little for the SQL group. So I apologize if I'm jumping ahead. Um, let me just double check on that. We, we, do, have, um, we do have this group running t concurrently. And I think we're doing the same pattern, but, but I might be off. Uh, but I'll finish my thought here, and then maybe this is ahead of the, the ahead of the game, and and you guys will catch up to this next week. So, um, so something to think about uh, where I wanted to end here um, is with a library called Modernizer. Let's see if I can bring this up. Mm, there we go. Close. Okay. Um, so again, sorry if I jumped ahead here on you. Um, this may or may not have been in the reading, but here's a library to look at maybe for, for next month and as you do the reading. Um, uh, it's a pretty common library. It's called Modernizer. And the idea behind Modernizer is it's a, it's a capability detection library. So it, it wraps up all of the things that you may want to check for in a very easy to use way. Um, so you may want to check to see that the browser does um, uh, let's see, features detected by Modernizer. So you may want to see whether the browser does um, certain CSS features, um, or you may want to see, let's see if we can get to here, HTML5. You may want to see if it supports the canvas in HTML5. Um, and you can do that by basically, or, or you may want to see what kind of audio it supports. You can do that by just saying modernizer.audio dot and which one you want. So it's a simplified way to do what's called capability detection, which we read about in chapter 10, which you may or may not have gotten to yet. Um, so um, let's kind of cut it off there and just say, you know, know that there's a thing called modernizer out there um, and it's very commonly used. And what it's used for is to check whether the features that you're looking for are in the browser that you're on or not. Um, and you use that as a way to know what, what code you're able to run in that browser. Okay, so uh, we ran all the way to the end there, uh, a little less time than maybe I hope to have. Um, but let's uh, point out a few things. Hopefully you've been using Plunker or JS Fiddle to kind of write some of your code. Um, know that you can save in Plunker and in Fiddle, you can save these things. So if you have questions on the group and you wanna show us snippets of code, it, it's helpful to save them in Plunker or Fiddle and share them with us. Um, 
and uh, hopefully Code Academy is going well for you. I didn't see too many questions about Code Academy in this group. Um, like I said, we had a couple other problems in our other group about Code Academy, but um, I didn't see too much here. Uh, and then Lynn posted um, Eloquent JavaScript, which is which is pretty good, um, and also a YouTube uh, YouTube playlist. Another thing I found too, which I thought was pretty interesting. Let me um, let me close up here. And I think he posted this. He updated the beginning of the JavaScript, learn JavaScript properly. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Um, so this is a group on Reddit. I don't know if anybody does Reddit. Um, if you don't do Reddit and you start doing Reddit, it's not my fault if you get addicted. So sorry about that. But um, there is a, you know, a section in Reddit for this exact track, learn JavaScript properly. Um, and it's a study group, and it's kind of an online study group. So this could be a good resource to add if you're struggling with some of this. Um, I haven't got into this fully. I just saw it the other day. Um, and so I haven't looked to see exactly how well this is working. But there are people breaking down assignments. Um, they have a bunch of comments here, people like chatting in a nice threaded way like to talk about it. Um, and there seems to be other um, learn JavaScript properly things happening. So, um, uh, yeah, so this learn JavaScript properly subreddit. So it looks like they have a whole, a whole grouping of learn JavaScript properly things. So, uh, that might be a good way to go, uh, is to check that out on Reddit if you'd like. So, um, I think we'll go ahead and cut it off there. Um, and thank you guys for taking the time today. And sorry, we ran out of time. Um, and so we'll chat with you next month. And in between then, please post to the group if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll talk to you next month. Thanks, everyone.